you know, you can say things to people like, tell, tell the truth and be good. And those aren't, those are cliches, obviously. And so they lack power because they're cliches. But you can take them apart and utilize them in a manner that stops being a cliche. And you do that by being more humble about them, I would say. Because maybe you can't tell the truth because you don't know what the truth is. But one thing you can do is you can stop saying things that you know to be untrue. And you might say, well, how do I know that they're untrue? And the answer to that is, well, you need a whole philosophy of truth. The elaboration of an entire philosophy of truth to answer that question. And so we're not going to bother answering that question because in some sense at the moment it's beside the point. That isn't the issue. The issue is there are times in your life where you know that the thing that you're saying is not true. It's a deception. It's a lie of some sort. And you're using it to manipulate yourself or another person or the world. And you're also possessed, fully possessed of the idea that you can get away with it. And there's a satanic arrogance about that. In, in fact, that is the archetypal arrogance that's portrayed in the mythological character of Satan. Because Satan is precisely the archetype of the element of the mind that believes that it can twist and and bend the structure of reality without paying the price for that. And you can't imagine anything that's more arrogant than that because really, do you really think that you can twist the structure of a reality and that that's going to work out for you without it snapping back? It's so obvious that that can't work, that, that everyone knows it. But anyways, back to the initial point, is that you know by, by the rules of the game that you yourself are playing, that some of the times you're violating the rules of the game that you're playing. And the first issue with regards to, say, stating the truth or behaving in a responsible manner would be merely stop cheating at whatever game it is that you've chosen to play. That's a good start and that'll straighten, that'll straighten out your life. It'll start to, straight, start to straighten out your life. And so, well, the flood, what, how does the flood tie into this? Well, you know, we live in a corrupt structure. We're corrupt as individuals. We live in a corrupt structure. And part of that corruption is just happenstance. It's the way things fall apart. But the other part of it is that not only are we not aiming up, we're actually aiming down. And the flood story is a warning. And it's a very clear warning. And the warning is, if you aim down enough, and then if enough of you aim down at the same time, everything will degenerate into something that's indistinguishable from the chaos from which things emerged at the beginning of time. It's something like that, because the, the, the cosmos that's presented in, in mythological representations is chaos versus order, right? The order is on top, you might say, and the chaos is always underneath. And the chaos can break through, or the order can crumble, and you can fall into the chaos, and that chaos is intermingled, intermingled potential. And the way that you destroy the order and let the chaos rise back up, which, which is exactly how it's portrayed in the flood story, is by, well, by inhabiting the corpse of your father, that's one mythological motif, and feeding on the remains, and with no gratitude and no attempt to replenish what it is that you're taking from. And the warning in the flood story is, don't do that for very long, because things will happen that are so awful you cannot possibly imagine it. And that'll happen to you personally, and it'll happen to your family, and it'll happen to your community, and it's happened to people over and over throughout history. And it's, it's quite interesting, you know, it's, it's very soon after the story of Cain and Abel, when you see evil enter the world in the story of Adam and Eve, along with self-consciousness. And evil there is the, the ability, that's the knowledge of good and evil, that's the ability to hurt other people, self-consciously, to know what you're doing. And then, of course, instantly, Cain takes that to the absolute extreme, and he uses that capacity to to destroy, really, what he loves best. He, he gets as close as a human being can to destroying the divine ideal, because, of course, his brother is Abel, and Abel is favored by God, and Cain destroys him, which Cain tells God at the end of that episode that his punishment is more than he can bear. And I think the reason for that is, where are you once you destroy your own ideal? What's left for you? There's nowhere to go. There's no up. And when there's no up, there's a lot of down. And, you know, there's an idea that was put forth very nicely in Milton's Paradise Lost when he was describing, from a psychological perspective, essentially, what hell is. And hell is, you're in hell to the degree that you're distant from the good. That, that might be a good way of thinking about it. And if you destroy your own ideal, 
which you do with jealousy and resentment and, and the, the desire to pull down people who you would like to be, let's say, then you end up in a situation that's indistinguishable from hell. And, and the way the story, the biblical story unfolds is, well, it's, it's, it's Cain and then it's the flood. And so Cain adopts this mode of being that's antithetical to being itself, at least to positive being itself. He does it voluntarily, he does it knowing full well what he's doing. And the net consequence of this, that as it ripples through the entire social structure, is that God stands back and says, this whole thing has got so bad, the only thing we can do is, is wipe it to the ground. And that is, that is no joke. That's exactly how things work. And one of the things that's extraordinarily terrifying about that sequence of stories, and I believe this to be true, I think I realized this independently of any of the analysis that I was doing of mythological stories, because I looked at what happened in places like the Soviet Union and Maoist China and in Nazi Germany, and the, the most penetrating observers of those societies, the people who were most interested in how it was that those absolute catastrophes came about, all said the same thing. It was rooted in the degeneration of the individuals who made up the society. You know, you hear, well, people were, fo were following orders. It's like, no, that, that explanation doesn't hold water. Or that you'd be punished if you resisted. Well, there was some truth in that, but nowhere near as much as people might think, especially at the beginnings of the process. More it was that people decided, each and every one of them, to turn a blind eye to the catastrophes and to participate in the lies. And that warped the entire societies, and they went as, you know, they, they veered their way downward to something as closely approximating hell as you could hope to manage, especially in places like Nazi Germany and, well, in all three of those places, in, in Maoist China and in the Soviet Union. And so, the thing that's so frightening about, one of the things that's so frightening about the stories in, in Genesis is they say something very clear, which is that your moral degeneration contributes in no small way to the degeneration of the entire cosmos. And you say, well, I would like my life to be meaningful. People say that. Really, would you? Really? You really would like your life to be meaningful? You think maybe people would trade a little nihilism to not have to face that particular realization? And I think people do that all the time. It's a terrible weight to, to, to realize. But we are networked together. In a, in a, that, that's the, the price of, or let's say, that's the vulnerability that's associated with our intense capacity to communicate. And it is certainly possible that the ripples of our individual actions have consequences that are far beyond the limits of our immediate consciousness. And I also think people know that too. They, they know that in the way that people know things when they don't want to know them. Which means they know them embodied, they can feel them, they can sense them, they have an emotional response to them. But there's no damn way they're going to let them become articulate because they don't want to know. And when you're feeling guilty and ashamed about the things you've done or not done, and I know that can get out of hand as well, it's often because there is a crooked little part of you that's aiming at the worst possible outcome. You know, one of the things Jung said about the shadow, you know, that Jung's famous idea that everyone has a dark side and that that dark side needs to be incorporated and made conscious. Jung said that the, the, the shadow of the human being reaches all the way to hell. And he actually, that's the thing that's so interest about, interesting about reading Carl Jung is he actually means what he says. It's not a metaphor. It's like the, 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 the part of you that's twisted against being is aligned with the part of the cosmos, let's say, the conscious cosmos, that's aiming at making everything as terrible as it can possibly be. And, you know, it's a terrible shock to realize that. It's partly why people don't realize it. It's, it's something that people keep at an arm's length. It's, it's the same as recognizing yourself as a Nazi concentration camp, camp guard, which is a very useful exercise because there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't have been or still could be one. So, and if you think otherwise, then all the more reason for assuming that you would be unable to resist the temptation if it was in fact offered to you. And if you don't think it's a temptation, then, the, then there's so much that you don't know about human beings that you're not even in the game. Because if it wasn't a temptation, then people bloody well wouldn't have done it. And plenty of people did it, and it's no wonder.